Yay, we're back. All right. All right, thanks. Thanks for waiting and sorry for, for being late. Welcome back, everybody. So first things first, I um, am three blog posts sort of finishing grading. So I, I did grade most of them. I think I have three left. If you're one of the three remaining, I will have it shortly uh, to you back. Um, and otherwise, I left feedback either through Canvas or on the GitHub thing that you sent. Um, and if I took points off and you'd like your points back, then please um, implement the changes I asked uh, for and the feedback. And uh, I'm happy to uh, give you points back once you do those. So that's not a problem. Uh, don't worry about grades. Okay. Any, any thoughts or questions before we begin? So, so Bogdan, like how do you want us to kind of update the blog post? Yeah, uh, if you sent it via pull request, then just update the pull request. If you sent it via Canvas or email or something else, just send me a, a new version or. Okay, yeah, cool. Whichever is most convenient, say. No preference. Yeah, I'm happy to regrade once you uh, implement the changes. Okay. All right. So for today, what I'd like to do is the following. So we um, so started talking about experiments a little bit last time, but didn't quite get into it. So I'd like to sort of dive deeper into how to design experiments and some of the um, pitfalls that you might fall uh, into while thinking about experiments and designing experiments. I'd like to start with the example paper. So I think they'll uh, provide a very concrete set of examples for us to critique. Uh, and then so we can discuss more of the methodological aspects in the second half of the class. Um, before I forget, so um, I wanted to recommend a few books. The, all of the stuff that we're talking about regarding experiments and threats to validity uh, around experiments and so on, all of that comes from this book, uh, the Shadish Cook and Campbell book. This is a little bit dry if you read it, but it's sort of the, uh, the ultimate textbook when it comes to uh, empirical research methods and experiments. So, um, so it's a really good book to, to read and you can find this online uh, or you can find it through a library or uh, the chapters we read together, I will post in the, um, in the Google Drive. Uh, that's one. So all the stuff about experiments that we're talking about today and other stuff that we talked about and we'll continue to talk about this is from this book. Uh, so I recommend this. The other books that I just came across actually, thanks to Shrey Zhao at, uh, at Toronto, she pointed me out uh, to these, are these two. Um, so the, we're gonna be doing a lot more quantitative stuff uh, in the next uh, however many lectures um, and uh, that will also include some so hands-on stuff that I will ask you to do as, as part of a, an upcoming homework assignment. Um, and if you uh, feel that you're rusty with statistics um, in, in whatever way, then um, it'd be good to brush up on that a little bit. I, you know, unfortunately, we won't have time to do a full course on like uh, introduction to statistics in addition to all the other stuff that we, we want to do. So I, I won't be able to cover all of those. But if you'd like to have, for example, um, office hours or a recitation or something, a conversation with me about anything around these, uh, I will help to the best of my abilities and, and answer your questions. So I'm happy to schedule something separately for that. But um, in the meantime, if you feel like you'd like to like brush up on statistics, there's two books that I, I was browsing yesterday and I thought were, um, were both very good. Um, one is the, uh, so the statistics textbook that you see behind me. Uh, and you'll find the reference in the slide deck. Um, so this is a very digestible textbook on statistics that does not use equations uh, at all and sort of uh, communicates or, or, or barely and communicates just, just the intuition behind all of these statistical analysis techniques and tests and whatever. So it's sort of a very readable book, uh, in, in, introductory book to statistics. Um, I, I recommend this. The other book that you see in the middle here, uh, the Crab book, is much more practical and applied. So it sort of takes a data scientist's perspective on statistics. 
Um, and you'll see a lot more sort of, you know, how do we think about applying these things in practice? And that's uh, sort of invaluable for the kind of empirical research that you're doing or will be doing uh, as well. A, a lot of that is sort of very applied statistics uh, when it comes to quantitative things. So the, the reason why I like this book is because it has lots of examples of how you might actually implement and run and whatever, do all of these analyses and tests in both R and Python. So it's a book is, uh, it tries to give examples in, in both R and Python for every single thing that it gives examples. Uh, so it's sort of very practical applied book. So anyway, so you'll find these online, I'm sure, or through the library or otherwise, and uh, they're sort of worth the read, uh, especially if you want to brush up on, on stats. Okay, so with that, um, then let's see, do we have Kyle and Hannah? Uh, yes. Yes. Cool. So how about we start with, with you two, um, and I'll to leave this to you to present each of the two papers or sets of papers. Uh, and then we can, so we can have a discussion after each, uh, and then we'll move on with more lecture material after that. How does that sound? Sounds good. Should we do, which one's more digestible? Let's do the data mining conference one first. Sure, okay. So um, yeah, in this paper, um, essentially what the, what the authors are trying to look at was that at this conference, um, WSDM, which is the web search and data mining conference, um, they've been using single blind review um, for, I guess, the majority of their, um, of their lifespan. And then they wanted to see if using a double blind review would have any differences or changes on based off of the high or based off the paper acceptances. Could you could you introduce those to us? Single blind versus double blind? What does that mean? Yeah, sure. Um, so single blind review is when the committee is aware of the author and affiliations of the paper. And um, double blind is when the um, the review committee is not aware of the authors and affiliations. So it's um, the single blindness comes in the sense that the the paper the author papers don't know who is reviewing your um, who is reviewing their paper and the double blind is when both no party is aware of any anyone's identity so um I guess a high overview before we can dive into the details is that what they did is that they assigned four committee members to every paper and then they two of them were blind and two of them were double blind. And then um, they had them review the paper separately and then give um, recommendations based off of the paper um, with that information. So then- Would you say overall, something about, sorry to interrupt Kyle, could you say something about what the research question was and sort of why they were, why they were asking that? Yeah, sure. So, the research question was basically um, whether inform like the availability of the information of authors affected, like, yeah, affected um, the program committee decision on whether a paper would be accepted or not. Mm -hmm. And um, they also looked at factors of whether um, there was a female author on the paper, um, whether the paper came from like a top level institution and they define, I guess, they kind of define what a top level institution is and like a famous author. Um, they also define what that is. So they were kind of wondering if they can make any statistical um, or like with this division of single blind and double blind review reviewers, they were wondering if they can make any statistical significance between these factors did they have any hypotheses or sort of why were they studying this? Or did they have any expectations or intuition? Yeah, so there was some previous, why they were doing this is they had some previous knowledge. There was some previous work on single blind and double blind reviews, um, but they they found out that it didn't really apply in the same vein as um, 
I guess their venue, like the conference, and I think also computer science as well. Um, they were stating that um, because computer science is a relatively new field and they use and you use conferences to disseminate information. It's a, uh, I guess there's a lower bar in terms of the formal in reviewing the formal methods in a paper um, for conferences rather than in a journal setting. And they wanted to see if um, that would change um, or yeah. So because of these different settings, they, they, um, they claim that this previous, I guess, previous studies on single blind and double blind review didn't really match their expectations um, in informing them how, how should they change their process. And I, I guess we're, they were expecting that there might be some biases when the reviewers see who the authors of the paper are, right? As, as opposed to not know who the authors are. Yeah, I think, I think their original hypothesis was they were, it was somewhere in the end, I think they were kind of surprised about a few details that, that I think they were assuming that it wouldn't, it wouldn't be statistically significant. That's something um, that it would be biased towards more important authors, or, or I guess, let me rephrase that um, more like famous authors and um, institutions. But it turns out that they were able to st statistically um, figure out that th th there was a bias towards that. I think what also what also had led them to make this initial hypothesis was because of many retrospective um, studies on this single blind and double blind review that gave conflicting information, whether it didn't introduce bias. So um, I think that's what prompted them to be, to first hypothesize that there might there might not be any bias or it might not be statistically significant bias. So now tell us more about the meat. So how, how did they do this and why was that a good design or you know, maybe it was a bad design? Mm -hmm, sure. So originally how the process works is that um, the program chairs of the conference, they invite a program committee or yeah, members of the program committee and also senior program committee members. Um, so these committee members, um, the program committee and the senior pro program committee members, they bid on a certain um, paper. They, they kind of look at the paper and see whether they think that they would be a good review reviewer for that paper. And then the chairs then go back after these, um, they, they have bid, they have bid, and they assign three to four program committees and uh, one senior program uh, program committee to each paper. And then each of them complete a review. And then each group discusses um, for each paper, they, the group that was assigned to the paper, they discuss it and they make a recommendation. And then the program chair makes a decision based off of that. So how the study was designed was that they didn't because they were working, it was the 2017 conference, they didn't want to bias or they didn't want to adversely affect like the outcomes of the paper. They had to be very, they wanted to be very careful. So they had two um, principles that they wanted to follow. The first one was a no bias condition in which that the acceptance of a paper shouldn't be changed based on the experiment. Um, and the second one was that they didn't want to lie to any of the program committees. Like they wanted everyone to be aware that they were uh, doing the single blind and double blind review. And they also want, didn't want, yeah, they didn't want to lie to them basically. <laughs> so how they did the experiment was that, um, so the first step was um, they, they chose all the people. And then for the program committee, um, so there's the program committee and then the senior program committee members. Um, so for the program committee, they split them into equal groups of uh, single blind program committee members and also double blind. And then for each paper, they assign two single and two double. Mm -hmm. So the single blind um, program committee members, they, during the bidding process, they were able to see the authors and the affiliations as well, while the double blind were not able to see that. Um, so then after after they did the bidding and then they were assigned, they made sure that there was two single and two double for every paper. And then they sent them out for review. Um, 
The review forms for both the single and the double were the same, except the single blind could also see the names and the affiliation of the entire paper. Or like once they got the paper, they could read the, it, it also came with the authors and the affiliations. And then once they reviewed, um, once everyone has made their uh, recommendation um, and the review, the they stopped the experiment there because um, they uh, this they kind of closed the experiment before the group discusses and also the program chairs made a decision because originally the conference itself was a single blind, so they didn't want they designed the experiment in a way such that even at the final stage where they were making I guess um, the final decisions on a paper, um, they still wanted all the information available so. Um, they didn't want the effects of the experiment to change whether a paper could have made it through a single uh, a single blind review rather than a double blind review. Um, so yeah, uh, so they they were only this experiment only was able to look at the program committees and not the senior program committee members um, because they couldn't get um, I guess an equal amount of senior program committee members for per paper and. Um, they. Yeah, so they also um, had to close it earlier because there wasn't really a good way or they've also discussed different ways to set up the experiment. Um, so we can I can I guess we can discuss that in the next part, but um, essentially the idea was that they didn't want to come. There wasn't a good a well found way to combine both single blind reviews and double blind reviews. So instead of worrying how to combine these reviews, they just simply at the at the final stage of a paper where they make a recommendation for the paper to the program chairs, they simply had everyone look at, uh, simply reverted everyone back to a single blind review. So what were the findings? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the findings was that um, it is, there was st statistical significance in a bias. Oh, so we have a bidding process and also the um, acceptance of the paper. Mm -hmm. So um, the bidding process. Uh, um, yeah, so for the bidding process, I believe the single blind has, they had more more people um, bid in the single blind review. Um, and also they had a bias with the single blind review. They also had a bias towards um, top institutions and famous papers. And uh, a top institution was what they defined it as was, I guess they had a list of the top 50 schools. Um, and they said, it, they also said that, oh, this may not be representative, but it seems well in line with what we would consider a top 50 um, school or a top institution. And also they included companies. They only included four companies, which is, I believe, Yahoo, Microsoft, um, Facebook, and Google. Yeah. So, and then the top, I guess, a famous author would be someone that has three accepted that has had three accepted papers at this conference and at least written at least 100 papers. Um, so uh, yeah, with that criteria, they did find that most of these or single blind reviewers were more likely to um, bid on these papers. And then they also found that there was also a bias towards accepting these papers as well. And um, third, the third thing they found was that there was, they weren't, so in the context of this study, they weren't able to statistical, statistically signify that there was a bias um, towards female papers. That's right. Um, but, um, once they, I guess they had a small section talking about a meta analysis, um, 
and then they found out it was statistically significant in which um female authors were um I can't remember if it was biased towards or against, but uh, yeah. Has, has anybody else read the paper or browsed it? Do you have thoughts on the design? What do you think of the design of the study? I see Bobo nodding. I only have a limited view. Let's see if I can. I'm shaking, not I'm nodding. Make the gallery different there. No, I, I'm shaking my hand, not nodding my hand. Okay. I see Bobo shaking, I rephrased. Do you, does anybody have thoughts on like the design of this? Is this, do you buy the results? Do you not? Kyle, do you want to tell us your your opinion? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think, so they did mention this in the paper, how it was very difficult to design the experiment um, with both in the way to make sure that um, they don't affect the outcomes of the paper because of this experiment. And also um, they didn't want to lie to um, the participants. So I think they did a good job in that, in that regard um because the design well i guess the because um the final decision still rested at like a single blind review so um they made sure that everyone was still aware of um the initial or i guess the final the final decision wasn't heavily impacted as it would be um if they did another um approach so i think they were they were also good in the sense that they noted that their design had flaws um, because they weren't, they, they also highlighted that, um, let me find a place. Um, they were, um, Maybe as you're looking for this, let me ask something else. Like, did, how did they assign the reviewers to papers or papers to reviewers? Was there any possible bias there or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 so I found it. So, um, so they stated that the experiment was not to determine if a particular paper was more likely to be accepted as a single blind or a double blind review because that's, um, I guess the, the, the scope of that is very large, but um, they, they simply just wanted to see if there was a statistical difference in the overall behavior of the single blind review and the double blind review. Mm -hmm. And then they also noted that the single blind, I guess the comparison is also tricky because the single blind reviewers make their decision based off of um, more information than the double blind reviewers are um, because the single blind reviewers can't have, or because they know the authors and the affiliations, they can make another, um, their bidding process is more involved in the sense that the double blind can only go off of the, um, the title and the uh, abstract. So um, yeah, they noted that there was a difference between the bidding process in that regard. And that might have, I guess, affected um, some of the values that they saw. Hmm. Was it random assignment or? Some other kind. Um, yeah. So I believe the bidding process was not random. Well, yeah, bidding process was not random, but I think the selection itself mm -hmm. was random. Right. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it wasn't, I guess, yeah, that's, they couldn't, I guess, ex exclude the biases from there. Um, in that sense. But, you know, I'm not, that sounds pretty robust to me. I'm not sure um, that there are really any to, to worry about that much. It's, um, it seems that once you have four people that want to review the paper, you randomly assign them to either one of the two conditions. 
And you know, over sufficiently many papers, you know, all the papers at the conference in that year, you have large enough samples so that whatever differences might be between the people and, and one condition versus the other on an individual paper level, they're probably going to average out over the, these large enough samples. And um, therefore, you know, whatever differences, if any, you might observe between the outcomes or recommendations that these two groups of people make for these papers on average, you can probably attribute to the condition they were in, uh, the single blind versus double blind, as opposed to sort of individual differences between reviewers, because you can assume that through random assignments, those just sort of wash out in the, in the aggregate. That, that was just my read of this, but feel free to disagree. Sorry, I, I haven't read it, but I'm just looking at this. Was there a total of four reviewers in the entire study? No, no I think I per paper, four per paper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the wording here was just a, a bit ambiguous with it. Mm -hmm. So how, how many how many reviewers were there total? So I guess looking at the count that they have here, it looks roughly like 120 for oh. 120 for a single blind review, I think. And they had an equal amount of single blind and double blind reviewers. So I would say around 240 reviewers. Okay. The, the other thing I was hoping you would get out of this is some appreciation for how hard it is to do experiments. Right, so like compared to other kinds of studies that we might do, uh, experiments are maybe among the hardest because uh, they, you know, there's just requires so much setup and, and so much care and they're very complicated to organize and so on. You have to be very careful with everything. Um, the payoff is also great though, right? Because they can make these causal claims about the intervention itself, the condition, a single blind versus double blind, much harder to make those kind of claims with a different design that doesn't involve random assignment, but also like really hard to set this up, right? So you can see um, high uh, pay, high rewards type of thing. Um, okay, let's let's move on. Thanks a lot, Kyle, that was good. Uh, let's move on to Hannah and talk about the formal method study. By the way, if you have slides or whatever, feel free to, to use those. Yeah, either, yeah, I have slides. Either way is fine. Mm -hmm. This was, um, Maybe for context, if you haven't read this uh, already, this was really interesting. It's rare to see um, academic drama play out in published work. Um, and this was sort of one, one example of academic drama. We'll see more later in, in the semester. I have a sort of particular uh, favorite software engineering example that I want to discuss with you later. But so this was one of few examples where um, academic drama happens publicly through papers. Usually it happens in you know, different formats. So that, that's why I, I thought this was very interesting. All right, thanks, thanks, Anna, go ahead. Yeah, it's essentially a case study in like formal fisticuffs. But uh, yeah, so this first paper, um, so yeah, this whole thing is like a back and forth between academics. And the first one, the original paper, is a formal methods application and empirical ta tale of software development. And uh, what this paper was uh, set out to do was to test how um, certain students who had had a, some sort of formal methods uh, background in their education, how that affected their uh, code correctness, quality, complexity, and also if that it had like given them any extra skills and had uh, elevated their uh, problem solving uh, skills. So the way they um, set up the design was that they had um, students split up into like a formal method section and a control group and they were testing for uh, code correctness, conciseness and complexity numerically and just looking at their the skills that they developed overall. And uh, there are about two students per team. And so how they split up these students um, is interesting because the, the formal method students had opted into a more methods based uh, experience previously so like years, you know, years before so they had taken classes, you know, harder classes or they had taken more supplemental material like specifically for like proving their code and you know going into design. Um, yeah, so more formal methods detail and program derivation education which the other students in the control group they didn't have at all. 
Um, but otherwise they had pretty much, besides for that, they had the same prereq classes and were taught the same material for this class in which the study took place. Um, and they also looked at the standardized test scores, which was an interesting choice. Um, you know, so essentially before, you know, at the entering into this college, they, the students had um, similar test scores, but later it showed that there was a jump of about 30% for the formal method students, which is a large uh, jump. And like, you know, we'll get into that later. Um, yeah, so the authors interpreted that as like the formal methods class, um, the previous experience in formal methods was the only consequential difference between the students. And uh, yeah, so they had these, um, these groups and the assignment was to create an object oriented uh, design for an elevator program. So just, you know, uh, programming how it should act and, you know, uh, the operations. Um, and so there were no design requirements for the control groups at all. They recommended that the uh, formal methods groups uh, submit a design. So for the control groups, only four out of the 13 submitted some sort of design. And they also don't really go into wh what exactly they submit. They don't go into a lot of detail. Um, and for the methods group, three out of the six uh, submitted UML diagrams and four out of the six um, submitted specifications. So, you know, they were, which were, they describe as well thought out with regards to prerequisites, post conditions, operations, um, et cetera. And so the results were that for the control group, five, only five out of the 11 had correct code. So that went through their like test cases um, and uh, yeah, performed well, but had largely bad style. So, you know, longer code with lots more like if statements, for loops, that sort of thing. And then for the formal methods, six out of the 16s had correct code. Um, the style was mixed. It didn't, you know, some had good code, so, uh, good code style, some didn't. And then after this, after the control and formal methods, so four of the um, formal method students decided to make a verification team. And they, um, so they had like very strict requirements with their design. So they submitted the diagram specifications. They're much, they much more thorough about it. And so they had like, correct code, great style, good complexity. So all around, they were a lot better. And so the conclusions from this were that um, the design before programming would have helped the control groups because you know that seemed to be the case for the formal methods groups. The uh, verification uh, teams was the best set of all of them. Um, yeah, so that was uh, complete and they had correct uh, code with you know, good uh, complexity, good style. Um, also good conciseness. They, there was some indication of decreased complexity for the methods-based uh, design group, so for the uh, formal methods. And then uh, conciseness was not really affected too much. The, even the formal methods students, they still had a little bit of like clunky code. Um, but overall, you know, they claimed there's a positive co correlation between methods and good code style. And uh, yeah, so they made some sort of comparisons on the right. So looking at like things like total lines. Um, so the control for most of these things, the control group had either, you know, more lines of code, more if and for loops, that sort of thing. So uh, this seems to be saying that the formal methods group had like more efficient code. And so for the uh, next paper is uh, comments on the this paper. So comments on formal um, methods application. And these are, uh, they're responding to the study. And um, yeah, so they have all these critiques and they point out a lot of issues with the paper. Um, so, you know, they point out that, you know, the, the biggest issue is like the voluntary assignment and not the random assignment. So the students who had already taken the, you know, they were already motivated to seek a tougher curriculum and get more advanced training. Um, the authors like of this one discussed that, you know, with their background, the formal methods students likely knew that they were being observed in the study. I mean, it doesn't, you know, yeah, so they probably knew what was going on and they have like a little bit more motivation to perform very well. And uh, they also mentioned that one of the students of the, one of the verification team students was actually a co-author. So that's obviously an issue. Um, yeah, and the, so when I was reading the first paper, they mentioned, you know, how they split up the students and they made almost no mention to like the bias that could be imposed with like these students who had taken the formal methods um, education. They like kind of skipped over it, which, you know, was a big, big red flag. Um, yeah, the dependence on the standardized test scores, um, which I think we all know is shaky at best. 
Um, there was yet yeah, again no detail given on the control group um, on what on the design that they submitted what that looked like there was a lot of um, emphasis on the code differences but we didn't really see anything on what the actual design was and that's like a big focus of the study um, and yeah they also mentioned you know the two main research questions for that paper was one um, how does teaching formal methods to undergraduates increase their skills to solve complex problems and the second one being the, does the use of formal analysis during software development produce programs that are more correct? So these are very different questions. And the study, the experiment attempted to, you know, answer both of them with this botched sort of experiment. And so they are they argued that you really need two more controlled experiments to answer either one of these. Mm -hmm. um, and so they also, yeah, the pre the original paper doesn't make any mention of like you know, this is a quasi experiment, clearly not experimental, don't take this too seriously. Um, yeah, they didn't, they really, they didn't have like a limitation sections at all, like very few warnings. Um, and like, you know, any very few notes on like, what are the potential issues here. Um, and so overall, the authors of the second paper um, hypothesized that the students themselves and not the formal methods experience influence the correct code design which I think makes sense because, you know, these are students opting in for a tougher experience and they're getting, you know, more education in lots of different areas. And maybe they don't have like the same constraints that students who aren't able to complete the curriculum. Um, and again, there's also a bias of, you know, with the formal methods education, they know when a study is happening and they have, you know, more motivation to perform better than the other students. Hmm. Um, yeah, finally. And so then the authors of the original paper responded to the critiques of the second paper. Um, so yeah, this this was interesting. And uh, so how they sort of refuted it was that the um, they sort of backed up backed up on like the code correctness because that was like a big issue. And they're like, oh, we we only meant out to like we only set out to you know test the effect on students' problem solving skills, not code correctness, which doesn't make sense because they reported the numbers like oh the you know the control group only got like 45.5% correctness and like the formal methods group got 100%. So this is great, you know, great results. And um, yeah, they, you know, a valid point is that they couldn't randomly assign participants, you know, you sort of need that background and that's what's being tested. But um, and yeah, the standardized test comparison was the best option that they had, or, you know, that they thought they had. So that's, that's valid. Um, and so they also, you know, in this third paper, they, you know, they, I like took the quote, our experiment was a quasi experiment, you know, conveniently mentioned in results to the second paper, but in the first, like I went back and looked at the first paper, they make no mention at all of it being a quasi experiment. And uh, yeah, they also mentioned no strong evidence that the entire experimental group um, was highly motivated. So there's a difference between like no strong evidence and them not looking for the evidence, which again, they made no attempt to do. And uh, yeah, they, but overall, so they, their, the tone of the third paper was like, oh, it's a big misunderstanding. We're here to clear up, you know, some issues, but we do agree for a more controlled experiment, but we don't think we really did like all too much wrong, which I personally disagree with. And uh, yeah, as far as like what to take from these papers, um, well, like it's interesting because um, first the sort of efficiency, like, the effectiveness of formal methods at education is inconclusive but i think like this is a great case study of like why it's really important to have you know well thought out experiments and to sort of talk about any issues that you might have before you publish it and let you know other researchers look at it um so yeah that's that's pretty much you know the summary of the fisticuffs thanks a lot yeah that was great has anybody else read these or does, does anybody have opinions Bobo is nodding now instead of shaking, like usual. Just to confuse me, I bet he's doing it on purpose. So yeah, okay. So I, I agree with this. There's a couple of things or meta points, begin rant and rant. So begin rant. The meta point uh, one is um, it's really hard to do any kind of study um, science research is hard. It's, it's hard to design studies and um, report on them and, and execute them. 
Um, and no paper ever is flawless. Okay, so like I, you know, I, I want to instill this in you. Um, you know, as one of the things that I hope you get out of this class, uh, I mentioned this in the beginning in a different phrasing. I said no method is without flaws. Like all methods are flawed, but you know they're also useful. Uh, it's the same for their application. The same for studies. Like all studies are flawed. Really, all of them are flawed, you know, just to varying degrees. Um, but they're also often useful. So I would like to temper your, um, I guess, natural instinct to be overly critical of, of science that you read, research pa papers that you read, um, because um, it's really hard to get this right. It's really hard to do this in the first place. It's really hard to get this right. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I think... The authors, even of flawed studies, uh, deserve some credit for attempting them, especially when the research questions they uh, tackle are, you know, hard questions and important questions. So I think, um, I guess, uh, you know, be nice as reviewers uh, is the, the, the better point uh, with all of this. Like, absolutely, you know, criticize, um, criticize work. Uh, the other thing I wanted to instill in you from this class is a healthy dose of skepticism. I said that many times, and I, I hope you'll get that by the end, if not already. Uh, but, you know, also keep an open heart and, and, and mind towards uh, research as you read it and uh, recognize that it's never perfect. Uh, ours, the one, that's, ones that, the one that we do ourselves is never perfect. I can say that for certain uh, when it comes to my own. Uh, and you know, similarly, other people's I'm sure is also not perfect. Uh, so that's one. Uh, rant point number two is related to this. Uh, so let me make this bigger so you can see this. This is a quote. I found this really interesting. It's a quote from the second paper. So this is the paper criticizing the original study. Okay, um, like check check out this language. Like, and unfortunately, the paper contains several subtle problems. The reader unfamiliar with the basic principles of experimental psychology may easily miss them and interpret the results incorrectly. Not only do we wish to point out these problems, but we also aim to illustrate what to look for when drawing conclusions from controlled experiments. Okay. What, when you read this, what does this evoke in you? Like what, what impression of the authors of this paragraph does this evoke? Open question. It's definitely a bit condescending. That was my impression too. So uh, I point rant point number two. <clears throat> excuse me. Is you know just just like I'm asking you to be nice when you're reading research. Also, be nice when you're like, writing and to critiquing research. And like to me, this seems this seems a bit condescending and, and sort of rude. Like this, I think personally, there's absolutely no need for this kind of language among colleagues, especially recognizing that nobody's work is ever perfect. Like this kind of um, language to me is is unnecessary. So I, I would I would never write this uh, deliberately. I would. So that's that's the second point. All right. So end rant. Um, I guess this was interesting though, because you can see how much difference. Like what I'm hoping you get out of this is some appreciation for how much difference random assignment makes in these experimental designs. Okay. This was a long list of things that could possibly go wrong when you don't have random assignment, okay? Um, and so the first one, the first paper that we read was a little bit better in that sense because it had sort of this luxury of, of randomly assigning uh, reviewers to either blind or double blind conditions. So th therefore its conclusions were a little bit more um, robust, right? Than the second ones. But um, so that's, that's what I'm hoping you remember from this. Any more thoughts on any of these? Okay, so then let me move on. Thank you very much, Hannah and Kyle.
let me move on and yeah um, and so talk about a few other things so i guess this is sort of where we left off our discussion last uh time uh, and i wanted to dive a little bit more uh, deeper into so this entire thinking about experiments and causal relationships the, the number one reason why we do experiments especially the kinds that involve random assignment is because we want to provide evidence for these to establish these causal relationships between between variables so let's look at uh, what that means a little bit more precisely so what's a cause what does what does it mean for something to be a cause um, so a cause this is an interesting term it's an I inus condition um, this is a mouthful insufficient but non-redundant part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition you know say this three times uh, one after the other real quick okay so let, let me break this down um, so think of a match the example of a match to start the forest fire okay you see that behind me um, so the match is not a necessary condition to start a forest fire I think you'll agree. There are um, lots of other ways to start a forest fire. For example, you could have you know, lightning uh, striking or you could have cigarettes or something else. Okay, so the match is not a necessary condition for forest fires to start. Okay, um, it's also not a sufficient condition. Okay, because it's not the case that every single time you light up a match and throw it in the forest, you will succeed in starting a forest fire. Okay. For example, if it's rainy, chances are it won't make a difference at all, right? Because the, the rainwater is just going to uh, put out the match. So uh, the, nothing will happen, right? So it's not a sufficient condition either. Okay. But um, you could think of the match as being part of this. A constellation of conditions without which a fire wouldn't happen. So um, it's insufficient, right? Because it's it needs other things. It needs you know oxygen and dry leaves and whatever else, right? This is a combination, a constellation of factors that are needed to make this happen. So the match is insufficient, but it has to be for it to be a cause of a forest fire. It has to be non-redundant too. Okay, so it needs to add something unique besides the other things in the set of factors, right? It has to add something unique besides oxygen and dry leaves and whatever else, okay? And, you know, if there's already, a, I don't know, a, a cigarette, a lit up cigarette or something, uh, part of this constellation of factors, the, the match doesn't add anything. It's sort of redundant. It doesn't uh, help at all. Okay, so back to this point, so it's an insufficient but non-redundant part of an unnecessary but sufficient condition, right? So this is sort of, this is what a cause is, right? So for something to cause something, it needs to satisfy all of these properties. Okay, so uh, quite a mouthful, I, I know. Um, so what's an effect? Okay, so how do you think about an effect? So an effect, to think about an effect, you have to think about a counterfactual. So the counterfactual is what would have happened to those subjects if the cause had not been present. So simultaneously, okay, right? So it's not what did happen, right? So you have to think about what did happen, for example, when people received the treatment on the one hand versus what would have happened if those same people had, sim had simultaneously not received the treatment at the same time as receiving the treatment. So that's, that's the counterfactual, okay? So the counterfactual is not the people that did not receive the treatment. It's so this mythical thing, right? It's, it's whatever would have happened to those same people if simultaneously they would have not received the treatment, okay? So, um, so th this is sort of what a counterfactual is. And therefore, the effect, A effect, is the difference between these two, right? Because you can't actually um, observe the counterfactual ever, right? Because so the simultaneous thing with uh, they, they would have had to be treated and not treated simultaneously, the very same people, it's just physically impossible, right? 
So you can never actually observe the counterfactual. The best you can hope for is to approximate it. So by the way, uh, speaking of counterfactuals, uh, if you haven't watched this uh, show or read this book, uh, then you're missing out. Does anybody know what this is? What this is from? Uh, so it's The Man in the High Castle. It's a book and a show. The show is on Amazon, I think. Um, and it's this parallel universe, alternate history of the United States after the Second World War had the Allies lost the war. So it happens concurrently with the uh, observed reality where the Allies won the war. So, it's, so this is a sort of a book and TV show about sort of living the counterfactual, if you will. Um, of course, it's fiction. Okay? But anyway, it's fun. So if you are looking for something to read or watch, I recommend this. Um, okay, so when you're designing experiments, essentially what you're trying to do is to so create a high quality, but necessarily imperfect because you can never observe it, um, high quality source of counterfactual inference, something that allows you to, um, to make this claim about what would have happened had those people not been treated at the same time as treated. Right? You want to get as close as you can to this sort of mythical thing that cannot be observed. Uh, and that's what experiments help you to do. Uh, you, they help you to do this. Uh, OK, so let's talk about this for a second. So we're talking about causal relationships or causal links. Um, what would you need to establish this? Like, what are some properties of the cause and effect that you would need to establish in order to make claims about causal relationships between a cause and an effect? What are some properties that either the cause or the effect must satisfy? The cause must happen before the consequence. Say the last thing again. The cause must happen before the consequence. I, I, I don't know what the last word is you're saying, but, but consequence. The consequence, yes. Sorry, yes. I, I, my, uh, the volume is, um, is low. Yes. So the cause must precede the effect, the consequence, as Bobo calls it. Yes. That's one, right? It has to happen before. Um, you can't have something cause an effect if it occurred after the effect was observed, at least not in the reality we live in right now. Okay, so that, that's one. What else? A te temporal precedence was the first one, or A1. What else would you need? I think it's a, it's a necessary condition that the cause must have some correlation with the consequence. Mm -hmm. Right. So there should be an association between the cause and the effect. Like changing or changes, variation in the cause must be associated with some changes in the effect. Right. Because otherwise, if the cause changes, but the effect stays constant, it can't possibly be a cause for that effect, right? It means you would expect something to happen, something to change. When you change the cause, you expect the effect to do something. Right? So there has to be an association between those, okay? A correlation, if you will. Uh, that's two. One I more. Feel, I feel like you need to have some mechanism of action. You need to be able to explain it based um, on something. Not to establish it, though. To establish a, a causal relationship, you don't need to explain it. Um, you, you know, it's nice to explain it. If you have a theory that explains it and describes the mechanism, that's much better, but you don't need to explain the mechanism in order to establish the causal relationship. Remember this, uh, I don't know if I talked about that in this audience or a different audience, the example of how they uh, started to, or discovered how to cure scurvy in the 1700s. Just eat some lemons, we don't know why. Yeah. Like eat eat oranges and lemons. We don't. We have no idea why. Or we don't know the mechanism. But it's, we've established causally that this works. So just eat them. Right. It took many many more years until they figured out why it worked. 
So that, I, I think you're right, it's a good point, but it's, it's not a requirement for establishing the causal link. So something else, I, I, I need one more, there's one more. What happened in the formal method study? Like why were the second set of people so upset with the claims of the first set of authors? Um, no other cough can, can cause the same effect. Mm -hmm. Remember the example of the match I just gave? Like what if it's lightning strike or what if it's a cigarette or something else? Yes, so that's the third one. You need to exclude other plausible alternative explanations from this, right? If, if there are plausible alternative explanations that you have not eliminated as plausible, then you cannot claim that this relationship between a, your uh, cause and effect, predicted cause and effect uh, exists. You cannot claim that unless you um, eliminate these plausible alternative explanations. So that's exactly it. So these are the three. Okay, so the cause precedes the effect, must precede the effect. They must be correlated somehow. And we have to exclude plausible alternative explanations for the effect other than the cause. Okay? So if you don't remember anything from today's lecture, but this, but one thing, if you have one if it's space for one thing in your buffer from today's class, you know, let this be that one thing. Okay, this is really useful um, thing to remember because you also see, now every time you read uh, or see people making causal claims in research papers, or you're thinking about making causal claims yourselves in your research, you will have these at the back of your mind. You know, have I established the correlation? Yes. Have I, you know, am I sure that the cause happened before the effect? Yes, right? Or, you know, is it that they happened simultaneously? In which case I can't really make causal claims about this, for example. Um, have I made the best effort to exclude plausible alternative explanations? Yes, right, so then you're golden, right? But keep, keep these three things in mind as you're reading and doing research yourself. So really a useful set of things to keep in mind. Uh, right, so this is sort of a, a diagram showing the same thing. So um, note how nicely this mirrors everything that happens in experiments uh, and the um, experiments that involve random assignment. Okay, why? Because, um, so let's go through them again. So in an experiment that involves some manipulation, some intervention, some treatment, right? That thing, the intervention, the treatment happens before you measure the effect. Right. So, for example, the COVID vaccine, right? You administer the vaccine and then you observe if people get better or uh, do not get infected this much. Right. So, the cause there, the vaccine, precedes the effect. Okay. So, you have that. Um, there has to be a correlation, right? So, you're measuring, for example, with the vaccine, you're measuring this improvement in people's health. Okay. You're measuring that association between administering vaccines and um, health improvements, and so that's the second one, the correlation, and through the magic of random assignment, remember the first experiment, the double blind experiment, through the magic of random assignment, right, you can expect that on average, the two groups of people that you um, study, the, the people treated and the people not treated, you can hope that on average, they're not dissimilar on any variable that may matter, right? So all of these plausible alternative explanations of which there are always many, for example, in the formal methods study, uh, it was that the formal methods group of students who had received more training or they were more intrinsically motivated or whatever, they had more experience with programming, whatever it might be with design. Um, all of those things, would average out if you randomly assign people to conditions, right? Individually, you know, on an individual participant basis, they won't, but on average, right, over large enough samples, they will average out so that 
you can assume that whatever plausible explanations, right, motivation, let's say motivation, that people are more intrinsically motivated, right? If you randomize their uh, assignment to conditions, on average, the two groups will be indistinguishable in, in terms of statistically indistinguishable in terms of motivation, because that's what random assignment does. Okay, so this is why uh, experiments, true experiments, they're also called with random assignment, are the gold standard for science in any discipline. Uh, because they um, satisfy these three properties that are needed to uh, establish causal relationships, which is sort of the, the ultimate thing in, in science in general, right? Right, cool. Um, a quick aside here. So this is in terms of terminology. You will probably encounter this as you're reading papers or, or whatnot. Uh, so it's useful to know the terminology. Um, when we talk about causal relationships, we, we talk about an independent variable X causing a dependent variable Y. Uh, the dependent variable is also called the outcome variable, um, if you will, or the response variable. It's dependent in the sense that it depends on X, right? X is the cause of Y, so Y depends on X, right? That's where the um, uh, names come from. Now, in this uh, context, a mediating variable is a, a link in this explanatory chain that's called a mediator. Okay, so that could be, you know, it could be that there is no direct causal link between X and Y. It could be that all of this goes through M. Uh, or it could be that, you know, there is sometimes a direct link and some other times it goes through M or, you know, something in between. It could be anything, right? But the, the fact that there could exist a link in this explanatory chain, in this causal chain, um, uh, it's called a mediator. So this, this thing in the middle is called a mediator. It mediates the relationship between X and Y. Uh, so here's an example. Let's say that um, there's a you're trying to establish a causal uh, relationship between socioeconomic status and child reading ability, right? So, um, Children from families with higher socioeconomic status can read better. Okay, so the, this is the, the causal um, link you're trying to establish. So here, a mediator could be the uh, parent's education level, right? Which is itself influenced by socioeconomic status uh, and uh, influences can cause. Uh, can influence the ch the children's reading ability, right? Because uh, on average, uh, parents that uh, have uh, higher education read more books or whatever, and they read more books to their kids, and they the kids grow up uh, being better readers or something. Okay, so this is a, a mediator here, uh, the parents' education level. The other one that comes up is the moderator. It's, uh, people are always confused about these two mediators versus moderators, myself included. So that's why I'm sort of, uh, explaining them now. A moderator is um, a, a variable that um, changes the strength um, of this causal um, relationship between X and Y, but it's not a link in the causal chain. It just changes the strength of this association. That's called a moderator, okay? So here's an example. Um, let's say there's a causal link between work experience and salary. People that, that have worked longer uh, earn more salary, more money. Okay, so here a moderator could be gender, for example. Okay, because um, we know, for example, that um, women earn less than, uh, than men do on average. Uh, at, this, uh, at the same uh, levels of experience, but right? we know this from um, the, the literature, right? So gender here is a moderator variable because it changes the strength of this causal uh, link between work experience and salary, right? The, the link has a different strength depending on the gender of the participants on average, okay? That's a moderator. But that was an aside on this. And yes? Okay, so uh, another thing, another aside, correlation is not enough. Remember, we talked about three things. We talked about association. What were the other two? 
preceding temporal precedence and no, no other other causal reason. No other causal reason. Yes, no plausible alter alternative explanations. Yes, those three things that you will remember if you can only remember one set of three things. There are technically three things to remember, but I'm sort of grouping them as a set. Okay, so correlation is not enough. You need all three. So here's, uh, there's many famous examples of this, um, uh, including in XKCD. So here's one, right, so things to ask yourself, which came first, right? Is, is it that you, know, you need to establish temporal precedence too? Um, and alternative explanations, you need the other two. So here, is it that income, for example, causes education, or is it that education causes income? Okay, so lots of um, plausible alternative explanations that would need to be eliminated if you want to make this causal claim in any of these directions. Right? There's obviously a correlation between income and education, but if you want to make this causal claim about some uh, so direction of, of causality, you need to eliminate a bunch of confounding factors, they're called, because they, they confound the uh, presence of this causal link, like uh, intelligence and socioeconomic status and so on. Lots of famous examples of how correlation uh, is not the same as causation. Um, I uh, encourage you to visit this website when you get bored. Uh, there's a very long list. This one here is the correlation almost perfect between the number of films that Nicolas Cage appeared in over time versus the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool. Okay, uh, this is real data. I'm not. I'm not making this up. And it's sort of perfect correlation. Is there a causal link? You know. Is, is it that uh, Nicolas Cage appearing in films causes people to drown by falling into pools? I mean, maybe, but it's a bit of a stretch. Okay. Um, here's another one. The number of CS PhDs awarded in the US versus the total revenue generated by arcades okay. and so on. So, you know, uh, check out the website. There's like hundreds, uh, lots of things to, to uh, laugh at. Okay, so some pros and cons here. Um, aha. So some advantages and disadvantages of experiments. One big disadvantage of experiments is that because they're so hard to run, like I hope you got that impression from the two readings, um, the conditions may be unrealistic. Right? So you know, often maybe we do experiments in a lab or with students and we want to make causal claims about how this might impact people in practice or we might um, want to study phenomena that take a long time to play out and so on they're very complex those are hard to replicate in a lab setting and hard to experiment with so, so it can be unrealistic another one is uh, the one that jeremy mentioned um, they don't uh, tell anything about the mechanism okay Experiments are great at establishing causal relationships, but they're not at all great at um, identifying the mechanisms behind these, okay? So think, for example, of an A-B test that you might be exposed to uh, when you're visiting some particular website. Uh, and you notice that, or uh, I don't know, the researchers notice that um, when, this is the Google example, by the way, the different shades of blue when they change the color of some banner on the website, they get a lot more traffic to that page or a lot more engagement. Um, uh, you can read about this, uh, about how much thought companies like Google put into the colors they use on, the, on their website and whatnot, and how much um, difference there could be between sort of very subtle uh, color differences. So it seems really silly on the surface, but um, it's true and it's causal, right? So, they here they could randomly assign uh, viewers to one of these conditions and observe, uh, you know, higher engagement or whatever, click through rate or whatever it is, 
um, in one of the conditions versus the other, right? It doesn't say anything about the mechanism. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say anything about why people are so much more attracted to that green color versus the red one. But but it's causal, right? You, you can expect that if you were to do this, you would get more uh, visitors or whatever, more engagement on your website. You can be confident in that causal relationship. We have no idea why it's there. Um, there's also, I guess we talked about this, so there's a unique advantage in that it's probably the best, not probably, it is the best um, method to establish these causal links. There is no better method known to science, uh, as far as I know. All right, um, a few things. So let me, let me do something else, because uh, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I want to challenge you, just pause this quickly here. I want to challenge you to the following silly experiment. Let me see. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Mm. Yeah, okay. So something fun to end the lecture with. Okay, so um, I would like you to please invent a series of 50 coin flips um, and just write down a series of random ones and zeros. We're, we're assuming, um, I don't know, one is heads or whatever, it doesn't matter. But just write down a um, list in this format in, in the chat or in the Slack channel right now uh, of, I don't know, around 50 or so of these uh, that you randomly generate as best you can, okay? So just, just write down a list of 50. Well, I mean, with, I would appreciate it if they had um, commas between them so that I could, uh, um, I could demonstrate the thing I'm hoping to demonstrate. I feel like Cal is trolling. Cool. <laughs> Even more trolling. Thanks, Cal. No, seriously. So just write down a, a list of, um, I don't know, some number, 50-ish, randomly generated binary digits. We will we'll laugh next time together about this. But I, unless I have your input, there won't be a laugh. I, I need to have more inputs from you. Huh. Thank you, Jeremy. Welcome. Thank you, Jaren. CJ. This was funny. Uh, I think you'll have a laugh when um, when you see what I'm trying to demonstrate with this. I found it very amusing myself. Austin, Sam, thank you. Jenna, Bobo, oh, thank you. All right, so that's, that's plenty. Simon, thanks a lot. All right, so let's stop here. I will see you all on Thursday and we finish off this discussion of experiments then. All right, thanks.